Today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash ghost. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You're about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. And on today's episode, something dark stalks two boys after they receive terrible news. A listener shares a collection of dolls she has gathered over the years and Why she chose them? A man finds a new friend on his way home, only to later learn of the tragedy that surrounds the new friend. And exhausted after a day of painting, a listener just wants to get some rest, but something won't allow it. Those stories and more today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Tony and Jenny Bruski joining you once again. Hi. Hi, and how are you this fine day? I'm good. How are you? I'm I'm doing better. Okay. Feeling getting closer to uh, to normal me. I was wondering because we're recording later than normal, so you've had dinner. Uh huh. And you opted for Mexican. I did. So I've I was like I just... needed something with flavor because I'm sick of vanilla yogurt and cottage cheese. I know, but I'm just wondering if I know you love Mexican food, but I don't know if it's going to love you back. I opted for something I normally wouldn't get. Okay. The uh, the fried jalapeno stuffed with uh, fried meat, wrapped in a pizza, <laughs> uh, and then fried again inside of a large uh, poblano. Uh, no, I, I did like it was it was enchiladas with chicken, and it was very. If you're gonna pick something semi bland on the menu, that's semi bland. Something safe. Although it's it is tasty. Uh-huh. It's it's not really I shouldn't say bland because it's not. I enjoy that, uh, but uh, that's what I went with. It's not what I would normally get, but yeah, normally I'd be getting like. Like the street tacos and then yeah. asking for their hottest salsa in the restaurant. I noticed that you didn't do that. The one where they double check to make sure they yeah. tell you when they bring it. To sign a waiver. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did not ask for that. And then I like I drowned it in that. And then I even like take whatever hot sauce is on the table as well, like the, the Chalua or something. Mm-hmm. And, and then add that on top of it. And then I go home and go, oh, what happened? Yeah. And you're like, you ate Mexican food and you put too much hot sauce on it, you dumbass. Um, but, uh, that did not happen tonight. I just, yeah, I, I went the conservative route <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I'm doing okay. I okay. really am. I have a little bit of a headache, but I think that's, I don't, I don't, I don't attribute that to dinner. I no. just attribute that to just kind of getting off of the prescription medications and, mm-hmm. and just kind of getting back into normal. See, mm-hmm. but that's a fun little, uh, drive there. <laughs> what getting off the narcotics? Get, getting off the narcotics. Yeah, that's good stuff, right? You know, I know there. I mean, and I, I, I. I've, <laughs> ah. <laughs> so I try to make a point and can't really speak. <laughs> you're not even the one drinking. I know, and you're the one with the glass of wine, and I'm just drinking out of my hospital cup with ice water. Sadly, um, you are. But uh, it's my been my mug all week. Uh, but I mean, what I'm trying to say, I think, is. Uh, I do not envy anyone who is trying to get off of the painkillers for a much more serious uh, injury or or period of time where you had to be on them. Yeah. Because that shit is dangerous. Uh, I, I've never really been on that any of those for, I think, more than like a day, you know, where it's like, oh, a, a routine in and out. Let's, you know, pluck this, pluck that, or or get this pus out of here surgery type things. Sure. Where it's like, we'll give you the Oxycontin like two, you know, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's that's been my experience with it. Not enough to like have like withdrawal symptoms. Yeah. But uh, I was on the uh, the hydrocodone since, the, well, since I left. But when I was there, I was on, I think the Oxycodone. I don't know. It was, Oxycontin. It's like it's brother or something yeah. or evil cousin. Um, and and I shouldn't say evil because when used correctly, I'm sure they're they've they've done good uh, as far as helping people not be in pain. Uh, and for a while, when I was on it uh, for this week, uh, it was okay. It didn't like really for me. It, it didn't seem to like really relieve a ton of pain. Maybe that's just you can only do so much. I never doubled up. They said, "Oh, just take two. Like I'll pass. I'll I'll yeah. I'll I'll deal with the pain a bit. 
Um, but I didn't even finish the bottle and I thought I'm just, I'm going to move over to, to Tylenol now and kind of, mm-hmm. cause I just didn't feel like much was working. Uh, and the Tylenol seemed to help more, but I'm on the tail end of this thing now too. Yeah. And, uh, t- stopping taking that stuff last night, uh, I, I went to Tylenol and actually yesterday on and off, I was kind of going back and forth. And, uh, last night I just did Tylenol and at about 4am I felt like I was in a kiddie pool, uh, like, like just sweat. Like mm-hmm. I just got out. Uh, cause I was like, Oh my God, I, I couldn't get hot. I, I, I couldn't, I was, I would get cold. Like it was hot. It was just, it was like fever, but not, Yeah. it was so uncomfortable. Um, and I think that that was probably, I'm attributing it to that. I have no other, I didn't have a fever. Well, it went away. So yeah. I don't think it's a complication from your surgery because Mm-mm. they warned that you know, because yours had ruptured, that there yeah. could be a complication that sure. could happen later on. Yeah. But that has gotten better. So I don't think yeah. it was that. It came and went like a bit of a wave. Uh, and I'm feeling really, for the most part, okay now. But uh, yeah, that I, I I can't imagine, you know, folks who you really need to be on it for months or something. It's like, okay, now get off. That really does require like serious, mm-hmm. you know, that's a whole task in itself. Yeah. It's like, now you're better. Now get better from this. Which has got to be like a total uh, mind fuck, you mm-hmm. know, especially if you're like, oh, finally, we're done with this. I can get off the painkillers. Oh, wait, now the painkillers are going to bring on this whole other wave of insanity into my life. Mm-hmm. But my goodness. Uh, so, yeah, that was fun for only a week. Uh, but, geez. So, there you go. That's, uh, yeah. that's been that. Uh, so, the Mexican food was delicious. <laughs> I'm Shannon Kay. How yeah. are you? Uh <laughs> That's uh, and we'll talk. We'll talk about the that story, the the pukey radio person, and our daughter's uh, affinity for making fun of pukey radio people. In just a moment, I'm baffled by it because she's never really seen me do it or make fun of people like that. She just knows it sounds stupid. <laughs> she just yeah. I mean, she just she kinda, calls out stupid. She does it on she own. sees it. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Uh, here and uh, just uh, jam in. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Wow. There you go. To call in your stories. It's the second time, and it's been 10 minutes. It's going to get bad today. It's going to get bad. Okay. Uh, you can also uh, write in on our website uh, at foodnetwork.com. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> at uh, realghoststoriesonline.com. Uh, or you can also, of course, become an EPP supporter. So help keep us on the air uh, at uh, ghostpodcast.com. Uh, let's go to our first story. Juan writes in. Uh, hi, uh, Tony and Jenny. My name's Juan. I'm from Chicago. It's trying about to uh, tell you it takes place when I was about 16. I'm 24 now. But the events took place that will not be forgotten. I was sleeping over at my friend Robert's house. We were watching a movie in his living room when suddenly I got a phone call. I watched as he listened to what was being said on the other line. I watched as emotion poured over his face and he threw the phone across the room. After moments of crying, he told me, that a boy at my school had committed suicide. I know this boy only through seeing him in the halls. My friend Robert and I didn't go to the same high school, but Robert had gone to middle school with this boy. Apparently Robert bullied him during those years. He wasn't proud of it, and to be honest, I was surprised because he was a great guy. He had utter remorse. Later that night, we decided to sneak out and go for a walk. Yeah, not the best decision. Now, sneaking out was nothing new. We liked the freedom, walking, Streets at night, the true meaning of night walkers, LOL. The discussions were always great. Normally, we'd go walk through the big cemetery that was near my house. It was behind the train tracks that still run all night long. As we walked along the train tracks leading to the cemetery, we stopped. To this day, I can't explain why. We'd walked into that cemetery dozens of times and on scarier nights. For whatever reason, we don't want to go in there. I don't know if the thought of death in our minds due to my classmate's suicide was a factor, perhaps. Regardless, without really saying anything to each other, we stopped, turned around, and decided to head down the nearby street. The whole time Robert and I were walking down the dead-end street, Robert and I slowly stopped. Our heads slowly turned towards each other, both sensing something. The hair on our arms and backs of our necks standing high. Then our gaze slowly moved forward in unison, slightly to the right. That's when we saw it, about two houses away, in a virtually barren front yard, a suburban home, beside some bushes, was a dark figure. 
It was someone or something in dark robes. No face, no features at all, just the robe. Now, this figure didn't acknowledge us, not yet. It instead walked or moved in a certain way. I can't articulate it correctly, as if it was walking in circles slowly without really walking. It, it held something that was blowing in the wind, and yes, the wind picked up a little bit as well. We stared at this thing for I don't know how long until it stopped and suddenly looked at us, as if finally alarmed by our presence. That was enough for us. We ran away as fast as we could. We cut through a side street that was to lead us to a parallel street towards my neighborhood. The street led to a slight hill. We rounded the corner and started running up the hill in a panic. It was truly terrifying and has earned a place in my time of timeline of horror sightseeing. I truly love this podcast and everything it stands for. I listened to it since Tony hosted it himself. Nevertheless, I come to enjoy it even more since Jenny joined. Thank you guys and stay humble and blessed. I think it may have been that they felt so bad, especially the one who had been the bully in the past. You know, I think maybe that just terrible feeling may have brought something on. Mm -hmm. You know, just on their walk, something that you know, it crossed paths with. Sure. And thought, ooh, I'm going to follow them. Especially since they had such a sense of dread that they couldn't go into this cemetery that they'd been in, you know, dozens of times. Mm -hmm. That it's just something, I think, kind of sought them out. The energy lingers. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they, they heeded its warning. Creepy story, creepy imagery in there. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us here on the show. Greatly appreciate that. 855-853-4802 is a phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Difficult to hire people these days. Uh, not uh, not the uh, the easiest task at hand if you're looking for, uh, for good talent. Uh, that's why there is Zip Recruiter. If you're hiring, this is a place where you can post to find the best job candidates with zip recruiter you can post your job to 100 plus job sites with just one click you don't have to go to like 32 different sites and create an account and register and it just gets insane then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anyone else so zip recruiter is different like other job sites zip recruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you it finds them in fact over 80 percent of jobs posted on zip recruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office or fruit baskets that you feel like, I don't know if this is safe to eat and it's probably someone trying to get the job. I've had weird things sent to me at radio stations. <laughs> really? Where it's like, oh, please hire me. I think the weirdest was like a box of, uh, it was like a weird off brand of chocolate covered macadamia nuts. Huh. And, I, and it was like the guy was like kind of going for a, like a surfer. It didn't fit anything we were doing, but like a, a, that was his persona almost like I'm a surfer guy from Hawaii and I'm going to send this to everybody and da, 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 da. It's like, oh, kudos for the creativity, but your tape is horrible. Uh, but thanks for the chocolate. <laughs> it's like, what are you going to do with it? It's like, you send yeah. it, you can't really send it back. Odd. You put it in the break room. Yeah. And then suddenly like half the office is ill. Uh, no <laughs> juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply Screen rate, manage candidates all in one place. Zip Recruiter's easy to use dashboard. It eliminates all of that stuff uh, where you have to worry about food poisoning in your office. <laughs> if that was ever a concern, find out today why Zip Recruiter has been used by businesses to, of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. Right now, you guys, our listeners, go to Zip Recruiter for free. That's right. Go to Zip Recruiter, post jobs for free at ziprecruiter.com. Go to ziprecruiter.com slash ghost. ZipRecruiter.com slash ghost. One more time. Try it for free. Got to use that code. ZipRecruiter.com slash ghost. Check that out. 855-853-4802. Our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Jamie writes in. Hi, guys. My name's Jamie. I'm from Seattle, Washington. Running about a couple of my ghost stories that I have. A few years ago, I wanted to experience paranormal activities. So I went on eBay. Bought a couple of haunted dolls. Now, I know that on eBay, you could get something that really isn't what it's said to be. But in this case, yeah, I got just that. I'd gotten a doll, a 50s gingham dress porcelain doll with a spirit named Margo, who died of an illness in her 40s. And her host doll has uh, cloudy gray eyes along with blonde hair. So 
So after a week of her arriving, my mom and I were home alone, arguing about something. I was in between my mom's computer room and the kitchen. It has a wooden floor, and suddenly I heard high heels clicking on the floor behind me. So I told my mom to be quiet for a second, and she heard it too. When I looked at where it was coming from, the footsteps were still coming. I moved into the computer room, and it stopped at the door frame where I was. Just looked at each other like, whoa. Two years later, I bought a cowgirl por porcelain doll. After 11 dolls more within that two years, I got attached to them emotionally. This one previous owner of the doll stated that she had heard dark growls coming from the doll. So I took it because over the years, any dolls that I bought that were negative just ended up peaceful. Like they like it where they are. This doll my mom got was so upset with. I just recently moved out with my fiance. I left the dolls over there at my parents because they were happy there. My mom sent me a text telling me to get rid of the dolls, saying that they are scra there's scratches in the living room, heavy glass top coffee table. She said there was dust from it, like it had just happened. First, I didn't think about it because she only had a piece of paper on top of it. Ten minutes later, she looked in the area on the glass that there were more scratch marks. She was livid and had a strong sense of which one of them did it. And it was a cowgirl doll. Currently rehoming the doll, so I guess this will probably be my only story until something new happens. I hope this gets read on the air. I'd be very ecstatic. I'll soon be an EPP. Tony and Jenny, you guys are awesome. I'm glad I found your channel on YouTube. It's nice to listen to on a rainy day. Thank you. You get what you get, and you don't throw a fit when you order <laughs> haunted dolls off of eBay. You can really get anything you want now uh, just by ordering it. Yeah. You want a haunting? No. Order a doll. Jeez. That's craziness. I mean, <laughs> I, I just don't understand people that seek out I mean, I get it when people want to investigate to find out if stuff really exists. But, sure. But ordering something that is, for one, said to be haunted, that's risky in itself because you don't know that you're just buying yeah. an ugly ass doll. And, and second of all, why would you want to bring that into your home? And once you prove to yourself that it's there, if that was the thing, it's like, okay, does this, is this really haunted? Okay, great. Why? Why do you want more? What's, what is the, what, I don't get it. No. Especially knowing like what these what could happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, because if you're going down the line of believing it, and and you you are confirming okay this stuff is real, this stuff could happen, then you would almost have to naturally assume you can also believe some of the real nasty shit that can happen too. What the hell? And some of the strongest stuff we've ever talked about has been attached to dolls. Yeah, it's it's just one of those things. It's just. Just don't do it. Just don't mess with it. I, I think that's even purposely ordering something you know is haunted is worse than playing with a Ouija board in my book. I'd say get a priest to bless them and bury them. Yeah. And I think that's how you dispose of the dolls. I don't think you need to rehome the dolls. Because I, I, I don't know. I just, I don't see the sense in this at all. No. Maybe I'm, uh, I don't know. I'm not trying to be judgmental, but I'm being judgmental. I don't get it. At all, if somebody, if you, if you can enlighten me on what is the thought process here of how you think that the bad possibilities are not going to come to you, mm -hmm. fill me in. How are you immune to this turning really bad? And and how are you going to feel if some naive grandmother orders this doll and gives it to their grandchild? And then something happens. Because there's a lot of that. Oh, look at this. And then the. It's and I, just <laughs> like I had when I yeah. was two. Because I can guarantee it's like one of those things. Yeah. Are, and then I put the receipt in the box. It's just, I printed it off the computer so you can see what I got. And uh, and just so you have it. And then like the the mom reads it. It's like, you know, haunted doll. Da, 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 da. Did you read this at all before you bought this, mom? Well, no, I just looked at it. It's a cute doll. It was a good price. And. Yeah, I mean, we all have that yeah. family member that does shit like that. Yeah. So just be aware you, you don't know that it's really going to a good home. Yeah. And if you actually do care about these spirits, you know, I don't think rehoming them is a great idea anyway. I think trying to just get if you're, these, <laughs> get this taken care of on your own. If you found the home for them and they like your mom's house, I guess it's probably time to buy your mom's house and go live back there. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> because maybe they're at, at peace there. And if you brought them there, maybe it's time to go back there. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost story with us. Steve writes in, this is a story that's a bit strange and kind of hard to explain. It does not personally involve myself, but rather my father. Let me begin by saying that my father still believes that this experience is explainable. And it's not necessarily of paranormal nature. In the early 1970s, my father relocated from West Virginia to Florida. He was a young man at the time and finally settled down in a small city in central Florida. One day, while walking home from his girlfriend's house on a route he did not normally take, he was stopped by a man and he walked past a house. The man began asking how he was and how long he'd been in Florida. I found it a bit odd because he was not sure who the man was. The conversation continued and the man invited my father inside his home to eat, followed by a talk on the front porch. As the conversation continued, the man explained to my father that he and his family at the house from West Virginia, that he knew my father's family and recognized my father because he was around when my father was a young boy. My father continued small talk, played a game of catch with the children, and eventually he said his goodbyes and left. Here's the interesting and yet disturbing part. The following day, my father decided to take the same route with his girlfriend to the home he had previously been to the night before. But upon arrival, confusion struck him. The house he was just at a little more than 24 hours ago looked completely decrepit and abandoned. This deeply disturbed him. There was no sign of anyone that was or had been occupying the home for a very long time. He thought he may have been at the wrong home, but quickly dismissed that as he called back home in West Virginia. My father cannot recall the family's name now, but when he called his family in West Virginia, in West Virginia, and explained who he had visited the previous day. His family completely dismissed it. They explained the man he spoke with the previous night had murdered his entire family and then took his own life only a month or so prior to this visitation my father had with them. Already disturbed, now my father can barely tell of the story without getting goosebumps. Yeah, I believe that. And that's just so weird that it's one of those abandoned houses that you walk by mm -hmm. and it's so full of life and you go back and it's it's not i mean to me that's that's even creepier than the fact that these people were all dead it's almost the wrinkle in time with ghosts yeah it's it's i was gonna say oh the house is gone or mm -hmm. something just like this is gonna end it happened <laughs> it's creepy it's like you've heard stories like this before it's like some things like this have happened before go yeah. figure uh 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. So uh, earlier at uh, at dinner, or on the way to dinner, one of the local radio stations here. And I, I, I have to say, I, I give kudos to the local radio in uh, this area because they still actually have human beings at their radio stations. For being a small town radio station, mm -hmm. um, most of those, uh, that's like a thing of the past. So they're like, oh, let's have computers run it and one guy does everything. Uh, they're semi-staffed. I mean, granted, you have the same DJs on like all four of their stations, but... It's still more than a lot of things that a lot of places do right. these days. And they have like news people. It's like, it's amazing. It's kind of, it's about 1998 in mm -hmm. terms of where radio was as far as downgrading. Uh, not how the rest of the country is with a lot of their local stations. Um, but with that comes uh, Pukey Radio. And people, they kind of talk like this, everybody. Five up to the hour, 55 to the top. Going to check out weather, and we're going to talk to the pet lady down at the Humane Society. Oh, looks like you brought some kittens in here today. How are the kittens? Oh, I love the kitten. Isn't that cute? Look at the, everybody. Oh, we're on the radio. <laughs> you can't see the kitten. That sort of radio. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's type of quality I broadcasting. Know. I know. Uh, you know, or, you, or the other one would be the... I'm going to talk to uh, Susan here today. You got a big event coming this weekend, don't you, Susan? Yes. What is it going? Where is it going on at? One of the parks. Yeah. Okay, tell me more about that event. It sounds like it's going to be really exciting and fun. I should talk in radio voice. But it'll be the bi the biggest event of the year. Everybody's going to be there. We're going to be out there with a the big party van. We're going to have the cruiser and the uh, we do a sticker stop, a bumper sticker on your car. And if you do, we'll give you a can koozie for defacing the back of your car. It'll be great fun. So tell me about what is it going on. It's a walk to benefit feline AIDS. You know, something like that. <laughs> That's local radio. <laughs> All right, we'll see you out there at the sticker stop for feline AIDS, everybody. Put the can koozies. We got it loaded up. T-shirt gun and everything. So anyway. 
the point of the story. Yeah. So there's a lady on one of the promos, and uh, it, it's all their their DJ saying, "I'm so and so, I'm so and so, I'm so and so," and then there's this one lady that really just takes it to a new level of radio pukery. Oh my god, she's the queen of it. And radio pukery means like we well, talk like this, but like I can't even do how good she does it. And Harper just thinks it's hilarious. And I've never even really pointed it out going, well, this, you don't talk like that on the radio. That's a bit much, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's really overdoing it. And she just starts making fun of her in the car and then mimicking her. And then all in the restaurant, the whole night, she's like, I'm blah, 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 blah. I'm blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like she's going to order that. Yeah. It's in like, that voice. It's like, what are you going to have for dinner? I'm going to have the nachos. I'm blah, blah, blah. Yeah. That's how that goes. <laughs> like, I'm just so proud of her for, like, already kind of... She gets it. She gets it. It's kind of scary. Yeah. She'll never get that radio pukey stage because at the age of four, she knows it's a bad idea. I had a radio pukey stage. I mean, of course I did. That's, you know, that, that's all I heard, though. I grew up with small town radio, and that's what a lot of it was. Yeah. But, uh, so that's, you know, oh, you're supposed to do it like this. Luckily, I had uh, a person that really worked close. My friend Todd worked really close with me and like, no, that's not what you do. And essentially beat it out of me. That's good. <laughs> uh, but uh, good times. 855-853-4802 uh, is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Serena writes in, hello, my name's Serena. I'm from Columbia, Missouri. I recently discovered your podcast, and I love it. Now, finally, I can tell a story about my experiences. That's starting with, I know this sounds crazy. As I grew up, and there's so many stories that I could probably fill a book. Even right now, it's hard to pick out one or pick out an incident. I think one of the creepiest experiences involves my brother and the spirit or entity of what we think is a reoccurring woman. It was around 3 or 3.30 a.m. that my brother finished a movie. Got up to let his cat out of the room. He goes back to his bed and lies down. Lights are still on and he's still awake when he feel, feels the bed compress. He feels it. He's wide awake. He swears he was not asleep and this wasn't a dream. He feels someone on his bed when suddenly he says he felt like someone had wrapped their arms and legs around him. Kind of like he was being spooned. He said he could even feel his breath on his cheek. I don't doubt his story at all. There's been multiple sightings of a woman in that house. What makes the story extra creepy is my brother was telling us a story the next day. His friends admitted to seeing a shadow dart down the hall that night as well. My brother's room is at the end of that hall. His friends didn't believe what he saw. Thought it was his imagination, blah, blah, but still quickly left. They both had an experience that could have tied to each other and only discover it the next day. Needless to say, my brother was a little upset that his friend didn't tell him about the shadow, like I said. There's so many stories, a few that involve this girl, but those will need to be for another time. Thanks for taking the time to read my story. I hope you pick it up and read it on your podcast. Keep up the good work, guys. Thoughts? That, you know, I think if it's the same girl that they keep seeing mm -hmm. and she's not doing anything harmful, she just wants to cuddle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a ghost. I don't think it's anything more in this case. Do you just let her cuddle? I would ask her to stop because she's got to be cold. I mean, you hate it when I put my cold feet on you. She can't be mm -hmm. a warm body to cuddle with. Yeah, it's kind of weird sometimes at night when all of a sudden I feel like a foot on my cheek. I, it's like, not why that are limber. you doing that? <laughs> not that limber. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's kind of one of those things like it probably would stop if you asked her it to. It's like, please, I, you know. Yeah. Okay. And then there you go. Yeah. Problem probably solved. 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. Mike writes in, mine isn't a story as in much as an experience in which you could feel the psychological trauma of a horrible historic event. It occurred when I began my tour of duty in Germany with the U.S. Army. Being new soldiers, we were required to attend cultural orientation, which is basically paid vacation. It was a week-long, day-long class that introduced all things German and culminated in a field trip to some place of historical significance like Oktoberfest, a beer brewery or castle. My orientation got the privilege of the trip to a small village just outside of Augsburg, where, whose name was uh, 
Dachau, home of the infamous uh, concentration camp. The day that we went to the unusually warm day for Central Europe, in the addition to the temperature being warm, it was also dry. That went on to set records that year. Never forget this trip because it was supposed to be sunny and warm. When we disembarked from the bus, it started to cloud over, plus it cooled down. The way the concentration camp was laid out, there was the main admin building, which now housed admissions, artifacts, and an auditorium for lectures and films on the camp and Holocaust. The rest of the camp consisted of one complete uh, billet as an example of what the living space was like, as well as the walls and the guard towers for the sake of those who died there. They left outlines of all the rest of the billets. Here's where the gets interesting because the time we went through the exhibit and lecture hall, it proceeded to cloud over and drizzled rain for a very heavy sky. I say all this because you have to walk from building to building out of the open without any protection against the elements. There was no infirmary on the premises. There was only a crematorium and showers. The showers in Dachau didn't have gas pipes or gas pipes to them like other camps, but it did have its own ordeal to go through. Such harassment or pole hanging or by a prisoner was hung with their hands behind them or from a hook by their wrists. This complaint, uh, the complaint department was generally a nine millimeter to the back of the head in a one-way trip to the crematorium. Getting to the point is you can see all this paints a horrible backdrop for our visit because the entire time we were at Dachau, there was the drizzling rain and cool temperature as well as a lack of of bird activity, which you notice immediately because we see birds flying around doing these things birds do prior to going into camp, and yet once inside, we never saw any birds. It's really evident outside the crematorium because there was a lot of trees in that area. I don't know if the Nazis were trying to conceal it because they were, uh, or if they uh, did a good job, or, I don't know if they were trying to conceal it because if they were, they tried to, they did a poor job. As our group slogged through the rain into the crematorium, we just got the overwhelming sense of sadness and despair like there was no hope beyond this. It was probably the darkest place on the whole tour and only rivaled the mass grave where 3,000 Russian POWs were murdered and buried down the road from Dachau. That place was dark too. It's funny because when finished the tour and walked past a sad little statue of a gaunt, shaved, bold prisoner outside the gate, it did stop raining. As we moved away from the camp, did the sun come out, warm up, and birds could be heard chirping away? Like I said, it just all seemed to be too coincidental. I'm not sure, but it just seemed dark and sad. I enjoy your show and like to become an EPP. Thanks for the downsizing of 2008. I'm still digging out of the hole. I'm thankful, though, because I'm still kicking and still a skeptic. Thanks, Mike. I think it is slightly paranormal in that there's still an energy that remains after everything is done and everything that has been done there. Oh, I think there'll be an energy there forever. Yeah, but I mean, do you count just different energies like that as, as paranormal? To the point where birds won't fly over the property? Sure. Yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's there's so much that went on there where, uh, you know, even nature <laughs> outside of humans mm -hmm. can feel it. And it's like, yeah, they don't know. And, and they may not know why, uh, the birds, but uh, there's a reason they're going, yeah, I just not go in that direction. Yeah. You know, they, they can sense things. Uh, they, they can sense obvious things that sometimes should be obvious to us that we are unaware of. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometimes... Things that, you know, may have already happened and are not going on at this moment, but uh, no longer uh, want to be in that area. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online. Peaches writes in, hi, Jenny and Tony. This is Peaches in Indiana again. I wrote in a while ago about the man at the end of my parents' bed, which featured the scary Home Alone style furnace. I loved hearing it. Read on the episode, The Witch, and had to pause the podcast to let out a girly squeal. Then my husband and I kept listening. I teased at other things I've had happen to me, and as the weather cools off here in Indy and the spooky season is coming closer and closer, I decided to write this one in. My best friend, we'll call her Bunny, house was always spooky. 
When we were in high school a good decade ago now, she used to hear noises in the garage, which was just on the other side of her bedroom wall. It sounded like a person was out there trashing the place. But once checked, nothing was ever out of place. She started listening to music as she went to bed and started noticing that when she had music playing through her stereo, the garage would be silent. I heard this once myself as we were up late high school, as high school girls do. We heard some metallic clamoring coming from the garage. At first, I was frightened and shocked, but moments after turning on our usual rock or dance music, the noises stopped, and we soon went to sleep. This was the innocent bit of her house. It was never scary. Bunny always said that the ghosts just liked their music. However, one night, a few years later, my now husband, my then boyfriend, let's call him Michael, stayed the night. We slept in the fold-out futon that was in the main living room towards the front door, which was only on the other side of the small walkway from her bedroom. The three of us sat on the futon, whispering and giggling when I shushed them. I kept hearing hushed voices, but sure as hell weren't ours. It wasn't coming from outside either. Only a few feet away were large speakers hooked to her mother's stereo. Not some old stereo that can pick up signals easy. I felt all the hairs in my body rise to attention as I realized it was coming from those speakers. And Bunny looked uncomfortable, stating she had heard it once before. Michael just sat there staring. Coming to the speakers sounded like an old 1940s music. Very hushed. Very shouldn't fucking be there. I played it off as some interference as we all tried to calm ourselves a bit and relax. An hour or so later, we went to sleep. When I woke up in the morning, Michael looked exhausted. The sun was pushing through the window above us and the rest of the world was awake. I asked Michael why he was looking so terrible. He said, I barely slept. He said, looking at me. Was it the speakers? Did it do it again, I asked. He shook his head with a lazy no and began. I woke up a few hours after we all went to sleep. I woke abruptly and terrified. I couldn't see anything, but I knew it was there. He paused. Just writing this out is giving me chills. Thinking of some unseen thing, he continued. I knew it was there. It was angry and it was standing next to us. It was staring at us. I felt the fight or flight mode kick in. I just sat there staring back. I couldn't go back to sleep and had to stay up and watch over you while you slept. I don't know what it was or what it would do. So I stared back. I knew then this man was the greatest thing life would ever give me. Michael stared down something that felt hateful, maybe evil. He protected me. Bunny never felt anything like this in her home and we never felt it ever again. Only the occasional uncomfortable walk through the dark to the kitchen for water. The thought in the back of your mind that something could be there with you, but never so hateful. That was all the events of Bunny's house, and luckily nothing ever escalated after that point. Thank you for reading my story, My Best Friend's Home. Hope that many other stories may make it seem to an EPP episode, which I'm so proud to be a part of. And next time, I'll write in there's some stories of my now husband's old home, which had plenty of activity. Thanks, guys. Love you so much. Can't wait to hear your comments on this one. Many blessings, Peaches in Indiana. I think to all the ladies out there, if you find a guy that is willing to stay up all night to protect you from something he sees that nobody else can see, that's awesome. Stick with him. I did that once with my proton pack. You were afraid, and I said, wait a second, I got my proton pack. And I stood guarding in the doorway. Yeah, not. You just kind of rolled your eyes at me, though. You weren't like, yes, hero man. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? I got nothing to you, say. You didn't. Uh, I was kind of disappointed. Yeah. You no. just you have that praise, and then I I tried it with my proton pack. You did yeah. not. You never protected me from anything paranormal. We haven't really had anything to protect you from paranormally. No, it's just usually happened, and then you're like, oh, okay. Should I bring a crucifix, some holy water? I don't like, know. What would you like me to do? Nothing, nothing. I. It's my own fault, or it's not really my fault, but it's that, you know. How I, do you protect someone from paranormal? Like, other than just, like, kind of being there, you know? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know either. He did. I mean, he's, he sat up, and I guess if it looked like it was going to attack, he was going to wake him up or something. I don't know. <laughs> but it's a ghost. I know. That's the thing. Who knows? You have, I think, yeah, I, I think homes should have like a uh, a kit in them, like a first aid kit or, or a fire extinguisher, you know, an emergency kit of some sort, where if you have the ghost activity, 
you break the glass and then you got like the the holy water and the sage and whatever else you may need to try and exercise a ghost. Should it be one of those situations where it's like, yeah, it's going to be a while before I can get somebody over here who can do this, uh, you know, professionally, mm-hmm. whether it be a priest or what have you. If you just really need to get a good night's sleep and it's, it's, it's ramping up. That should be everybody's new go-to wedding gift. Be a great or a great gift that a realtor gives the uh, the people. Who... <laughs> oh, I'd be so pissed if I got that after I just bought a house. It's like, well, here's the keys, and uh, I got you guys a little gift, and you open it up, and like that's what it is. Yeah. It's like, what does this mean? Nothing. I'll see you later. <laughs> That'd be great. It'd be wonderful. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Louise writes, and I live in Yorkshire, England. My great-grandma was quite sensitive to the paranormal, and I believe I inherited a little of her gift. The most memorable story I have is when she saw a pair of arms crossed over a chest in the turn of the stairs in her home, and she told my grandmother what she saw. About an hour later, her father came to tell her that her aunt had sadly passed away. Anyway, my story is surrounding my childhood home, in which my mother still lives. It used to be a set of about four Separately rented rooms. I shared a bathroom until my parents moved in the year before I was born and just became a regular family home again. My first memory of witnessing something strange was when I was six years old. I remember it was a Sunday. My grandmother had been around for dinner and at the time my mother had left to take her home and I was on the sofa with my father. He was doing what he usually does after a large roast dinner, falling asleep. I'd been watching television when suddenly I had this weird feeling come over me. I turned around and saw a woman who looked to be middle-aged, maybe her 40s or 50s, walk through the sitting room door. She was dressed in a dressing gown, slippers and rollers in her hair, and a hairnet or scarf over the top of them. She walked ahead, didn't turn her head, and walked straight through the room and through the porch door. I remember not really feeling afraid, just like something wasn't right. The second incident in the house, I didn't experience it. It was my older sister. She slept in the attic at the time and must have been around 14 or 15. It was late one night and she was laid in bed when she heard someone walk up the stairs into her room. Being such an old house, the stairs were creaky. so It was an unmistakable noise. She looked over waiting to see me climbing her stairs to find a dark shadow that quickly disappeared. She shouted for my mother and made her check the whole house because she wasn't satisfied that there was no one there. She came to check on me to make sure I hadn't snuck up there being six or seven at the time and I was fast asleep. Growing up, I always felt like I was being watched and would run up from the cellar if I had to go down there for something. I often left lights on just to avoid the casting of shadows in the house. The third thing that happened in the house, I was 18 years old. I was laid in bed one night watching TV since it was, I was quite the night owl and would often be up until 3 or 4 a.m. While I laid there, I felt this breath on my neck. Not just regular breathing, but more like someone had inhaled deeply and blown that breath against my cheek. That's the most noticeable things that I've from my childhood home. And sorry it's so long. I have several other stories I'd like to share from my teens, but I'll share those with you later. I only stumbled upon the show by accident last week, so I have a lot of catching up to do, but I really love the podcast and I've been listening whenever I can. I'll be becoming an EPP. I look forward to the extra podcast. Keep up the good work. Although there's a place for people who experience the paranormal to share and discuss their encounters. Sounds like a pretty active childhood home. Yeah. I think my favorite's the the ghost that still has her hair in rollers with the scarf over her head. Mm-hmm. That's, that's just classic. I don't understand <laughs> that. I mean, is that just like, this is the image I want to project? I died with rollers in my hair? Or is it... I, I just, when things like that come about, if it was a human ghost, why is that the image that you, you are showing? I don't know. And, you know, maybe, like we've talked about, maybe they don't always get a choice. Sure. Yeah, maybe you don't get a choice. Maybe you're still doing stuff, and maybe she has rollers in her hair on her own, her own side. Yeah. Maybe, or maybe that's more of a wrinkle in time type thing where this isn't really technically a ghost ghost, but we're looking at essentially like a TV mm-hmm. into uh, the view of someone else uh, in, in their regular life. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number. 
Ashley writes in, hello, my name's Ashley. I'm 29 years old. Not your typical scared of everything girl. Actually, it takes a lot for me to get even jumpy. So here it goes. Back in 2010, my husband and I had decided to brighten up our home and make things more homey and happy. We've been remodeling for a couple of weeks and we started painting. We painted all day and around 3 a.m. in the morning. I was just so tired. I asked my husband if he wanted to quit and go to bed. He said, yeah, you go ahead and let me use the rest of the paint we had out. I said, okay, babe, and proceeded to go to our bedroom and turn out all the bedroom lights. As I was turning them out this night, I had a sense of dread for it to be completely dark, but I had no reason to feel that way. So I brushed it off and laid down. For no apparent reason, reminding you my husband was in the next room, still painting, maybe 20 feet away, I started feeling extremely terrified. I felt something in the room as well as watching me in the darkest depths of the room. I got so scared I jumped up and turned the light on. Of course, nothing was there once the light was on, so I went into the living room and asked my husband to come lay down, and he said, okay, came to bed. He and I never fall asleep immediately. Never. So... And so as, uh, as soon as we laid down, I said, love you. No response came from Joey. And so I said, Joey, Joey. And he was asleep, out cold. I shook him and nothing. So I got as close to him as possible. I was doing this fear, the terror I felt from earlier come back. This time I was so scared I couldn't move. I closed my eyes and pulled my covers over my eyes. And I felt my covers being pulled off me. At first, I thought maybe it was my husband stealing my covers, but then I realized he wasn't moving to even move the covers off me. I pulled the covers tightly over my head. And about that time, still very much awake, my body became completely paralyzed and the covers started slowly being pulled off from something coming from the foot of the bed as the cover was pulled past my eyes. I looked to see what it was and saw nothing at first, just watching my covers move off me. I looked again and my eyes adjusted and saw something darker. And the dark is dark, moving. And I immediately closed my eyes. My covers were finally completely off me. I started hearing this indescribable sound. I opened my eyes and this thing stood up. And all I could see is its outline form, around eight foot tall. Like a cloak and a hood shaped, dark black body figure with long fingers pointed at me. Then it turned and walked around at the bottom of my bed, around to the side of my bed, and turned its head and looked at me and turned its head back and proceeded into our hallway. As soon as it walked into the hallway, I could move. I immediately jumped up, turned the lights on, but for five days I was in shock, too afraid to say anything. So that is what I'm leaving you with for now. No, that's not all. It's just the beginning. I think... <laughs> you know, we could go with the whole it didn't like what they were doing to the house side of things. Or could it be that she was just so exhausted that she was a prime candidate for sleep paralysis? Mm -hmm. I guess we're not going to know until we hear the rest of the story. Yeah, because I wonder if anything continued to happen. It sounds like something continued. So yeah, fill us in on the rest and we'll give you more feedback. Uh, Victorine writes in. Hi, Tony and Jenny. My name is uh, Victorine. I shared a couple of stories. Just hope you receive them. After four years of being in the U.S., I decided to go visit my family in uh, Cameroon and introduce my son to his grandmother. While I was there, I decided to catch up with my brother. I started talking about our childhood and how messed up it was. He and I share the passion of the paranormal, and he started telling me stories about the different houses we had and all the creepy stuff happening in them. I remember I was five or six years old and one of my brothers rushed out of his room screaming and ran outside. He was crying and screaming in pain, holding the back of his neck. My mother ran out and found him sitting in the veranda crying. He pulled his hand from his neck and you could see four distinct and deep wounds. Like he was scratched by a feline, like a tiger or a bear. This happened like three different times in different areas of his body. A second time was his arm. Third time, he told my mom that he dreamed he was being chased by an evil creature. When it caught up to him, he woke up to burning feelings on his back. And again, the wounds were deep. The third time, he was taken to the hospital. The doctors told my mom his wounds were not simple and she should see a priest, which she did. 
After nine days of purification prayers, the attacks stopped. Cameroon. In Cameroon, things are wild, especially when it comes to paranormal, witchcraft, or evil cult. I have more stories, and this is just a portion of the story of my life. Like I said earlier, our childhood was horrible. Next time I'll tell you the story about the evil bird at my cousin's house. This is Victorine from Maryland. Kudos to that doctor for suggesting alternative ways to get help in the situation. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's, I don't know if it's that culture where they accept that and they're open to saying, hey, I think maybe you might have a slight, you know, paranormal issue. Why don't you uh, mm -hmm. look at some other options? Yeah, it's probably a cultural thing mm -hmm. as far as what, you know, is socially accepted and probably medically can be uh you know, recommended. Sure. I don't know that, I mean, could a doctor in this country even recommend anything of the sort of like, okay, you got this going on, that going on. I think like the closest would just be seek psychological help for anything that's remotely in the realm of paranormal. I think they would get a caseworker involved and that's probably yeah. all they can do at that point. I don't think they legally even can say anything about paranormal because it would be, probably violates, you know, something, some sort of medical practice and Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. 855-853-4802, our number. Elizabeth writes in. A little background on my story. I've been a sensitive my whole life. My husband, on the other hand, is a non-believer. We have a three-year-old son, a 102-pound black Labrador retriever, and a five-pound cat. Our pets are part of our family. We moved into our house the month before our son was born. We've experienced something in the house that I cannot find any information on. I started listening to your podcast a few weeks ago. Secretly wondering if maybe I would hear a story like mine. And there was an episode about pets. I thought I'd share my story. When our son was about two months old, I was in the kitchen cooking dinner. My husband had the baby upstairs. I walked over to the trash to throw something away. As I turned to face the trash, I saw what I thought was our dog standing to the side of me. Maybe three feet or so away facing me. I threw the trash away and turned to interact with him. He was gone. Our dog doesn't move fast. Something wrong with one of his back knees. He has a heart murmur, and he is an old spirit. I looked around, but he was nowhere to be found. I started calling him, then I heard my husband open the bedroom door and walk into the hall, with the baby followed by our dog. The dog had been upstairs with my husband the whole time behind a closed door. About a year later, I encountered the dog again, this time standing by the back glass door waiting to come in. I opened the back door to let what I thought was our dog in, but the dog that was standing by the door was gone. I looked out to see our dog standing in the back, back of the yard. There's no way he could have gotten to the back of the yard in that few seconds. It took for me to open the glass door. The apparition of this dog is solid and it looks identical to our dog. After a few more encounters like the one above, my husband was confused that he too had seen the dog. It scared him so bad he did not want to worry me. He saw the dog one morning sitting in the front porch. He panicked, not knowing how our dog could have gotten out of the house and why he'd be sitting on the front porch alone. Upon opening the door, the dog was gone. We don't see that dog a lot, maybe every six months or so. He even had a friend who was in the house see the dog. After the first sighting, I was talking to a neighbor who told me the people who used to live in our house had a dog die when they lived there. I didn't question him on this, but wish I had. My sister had a lab when I was younger. We're 15 years apart. Oh, why would we be seeing someone else's dog? Our pets do not react to this dog. We've had weird sounds in the house, like someone walking or a big dog walking. We have things go missing to reappear months later and sometimes years later, or not at all. Our door to our garage, even before our son could walk, mysteriously locks itself to the point where we have hidden a key in the garage. I don't know why they would be seeing that dog. Well, maybe the dog just is at home there. Maybe the dog is a dog that liked the house better than the people. Could be. Could be the dog's still looking for his people. It could be that too. But I would think, you know, pe you know, people make attachments to homes. I would think animals could do the exact same thing, regardless of who's living there, whether it be the next of kin or strangers, mm -hmm. same way that people haunt homes. Yeah. So I think that might just be the uh, the answer to that one. 
Thanks for sharing the story with us. We greatly appreciate it. That wraps up this episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. Thanks for listening. If you like the program, help keep us on the air, become an EPP extra podcast person. Sign up to be one of those on our website at ghostpodcast.com. Five bucks a month is all we ask. You sign up for a full year and get one of those months free and a bunk bed bell as well. So check that out at ghostpodcast.com. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.